Welcome to Nursing 341 High Risk Unit. This session, we're looking at burns and scars in pediatrics. So, burns is an injury or damage to the skin. The mucous membranes or conjunctiva may be caused by heat in terms of electricity, chemicals, friction, or radiation, or even hot air in terms of vapor. So the burns is by dry heat, and then the scald is what is caused by liquid or hot liquid. So that is what I mean by vapor. So burns, regardless of the extent or depth, lead to loss of fluid and electrolytes. You know that the skin is the biggest organ, and so when it is affected, and there is a lot of fluid loss which needs to be replaced in order to return the child's system back to normal or hemostasis. The goals and objective. At the end of the session, students will be able to enumerate the causes of burns and scars, explain the clinical manifestations of burns and scars, discuss the deaths of burns first degree, second degree, that is in terms of classification or types, and then describe the management of burns. For our session outline, the, the key topics we are going to look at are the causes of burns and scars, the clinical manifestations, types of burns, and then pathophysiology of burns, and then the management of burns. So once again, our textbook, we're looking at chapter 30 of Wong's Exceptional Pediatrics, who addresses, and you can also get scholarly articles online through Google Scholar or the University of Ghana databases, and then you can read on it as well. So we're saying that burns and skulls is quite common in our setup and can also be fatal. So in cases where more than 10% of the body surface is bent, it's, it is life-threatening and must be given the proper or adequate treatment. And it is also important to note that the severity is related to the amount or extent of tissue damage. So now we're looking at the causes of burns. We're saying that heat, so you can have dry heat, as you have from electricity. You can have moisture from a boiling soup or friction. And you can also have chemicals. You have chemicals like savlon, even causing burns in some newborns when the concentration is more than required. So it's very important that the chemicals that we use are properly mixed. It's also important to know that ionizing radiation, in cases where we give radiation therapy, it can also cause veins. X-rays also to, if, can also be a source of veins and nuclear explosions and more. So electric current. We have seen that in cases where the plugs are faulty or bare wires are exposed, individuals who come into contact with them can have some burns from these. And also in cases where there are fumes, you can have inhalation, smoke or toxic fumes. In this case, the individual's internal organs may be involved. So what are the clinical manifestations we see? So we have said, or I have said earlier on in this class, that the extent of damage or the degree determines what you see. So changes in skin color, in cases where it is superficial, you may have pink, red, white, you have brown and black coming in when the degree is extensive and you have blisters forming in superficial veins. So maybe the vapor or iron touches your skin 
or hot water pod or pours on you and you have some blisters. That's a, a, a type of superficial burn. So here we are saying that the nerves are all exposed. So it's very, very painful. And in cases where the lungs and others are, 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 are involved, in cases where the individual has inhaled some toxic fumes or some dry explosions from gas, as we have in our homes for cooking, the individual may be wheezing, there may be sore throat or hoarseness of voice to indicate that the airway is involved in this case. So types of burns. We are saying that hot water may cause some scars in toddlers. And burns would also result from hot surfaces or electrical injury. And all these will at least bring about some type of burns. That is the, what is causing the injury. And we could also have the extent referring to the degree. So here we are saying that superficial burns is the same as first degree burns. And in this case, the tissue damage is minimal. And systemic effect is rare when it is superficial. So it is the skin, blisters are formed, and if they break, the nerve endings are exposed. In this case, it's very, very painful. However, depending on where this occurs, within first week, if it's properly cared for, the wound heals without scarring. Partial sickness or second degree burns who also is telling us about the extent of the burns. Here, the skin is involved to the epidermis level. And here also, there may be varying degrees of level of involvement in the dermis. So the wounds here are also painful. They are moist because fluid is oozing. They are red. They are blistered also. And also, it takes about 14 days with some minimal scarring occurring here. The sweat glands here and the hair follicles may remain intact. But when it comes to third degree or full thickness banks, we're saying that the entire epidermis and the dermis and the subcutaneous nerve and the sweat glands, hair follicles are destroyed. The color here varies from red to tan, or maybe white or brown or black, as I said earlier, and may have dry, leathery appearance, and there is lack of sensation because the nerve endings are all destroyed, the painful sensation returns, as the peripheral fibers regenerate during healing process. You have four degree burns where there is also full thickness involving underlying structures like muscles and bones. So the wound appear to be dull and dry, ligaments, bones, and muscles are all destroyed and exposed. So classification, it may be minor, it may be moderate or major. When it is minor, usually this is treated at the on OPD basis and the patient goes home and comes daily for dressing or every other day for dressing, depending on the protocol observed in the institution. And moderate, most hospital admission is required for the treatment with expect care. And then when it is major, there may be the need for specialized care. And because of the amount or extent of damage, there may be the need for grafting. So there may be the need to take the patient to surgery and do some reconstructive surgery. So when it comes to the uh, bangs, we're saying that superficial tissues are damaged. And here, in, 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 in partial thickness, only the skin 
to the excluding the epidermis, so the nerve endings are exposed and it's painful. In partial thickness, we're saying that there is some degree of edema. And in about 12 hours and after the injury for a small wound, and in major burns, more than 30%, there is increased capillary permeability, allowing plasma proteins and fluid and electrolyte loss, which will also result in some edema. And some anemia may also result from destruction of red blood cells and also hemolysis also resulting from further breakdown. And then when the blood vessels get trapped, there may be increased blood flow to the heart and kidney and brain and intestines and also increased metabolism may be required to provide heat to the injured patient. So in terms of management, in emergency, you have to stop the burning process immediately. So if it is chemical burns, you have to wash the patient and bathe the patient so that whatever is causing the burning, if it is hot water, as you wash, you cool down the burning process. That is caused by the hot object. And then assess the victim's condition at, at a time by assessing the vital signs the degree and the extent, and then you need to cover the wound and transport the child to the hospital if it is in the community. Or if it is in a, a peripheral area, you have to maybe transport to a bigger hospital after you have assessed and then maybe giving some intravenous or whatever resuscitation measures and provide reassurance to the parents. So calculation of banks, how much is involved? This is calculated, as we know, in, pe in patients above age 40, we use a rule of nine. However, in younger children uh, under five years, we use the rule of the palm, where the palm represents 1% of the bent surface. This diagram is also here to show us some or help us as a guide to calculate. So you see here that in this diagram, we have various ages represented, one, five, and 10. And if you look at the head, this is the front and this is the back. Here on the diagram, the head has A and D. So the A is for the front part and the D is for the back. So under 10 years, the head, banks involving the head is 10%. Under one year, it is 9%. Under five years, it is 7%. And under 10 years, it is 6%. So you see that the age affects the calculation. And then when it comes to the chest, it is 13% in front and at the back. And each arm is 5% both front and back. So depending on the extent, if it's both the anterior and the posterior aspects of the hand that are affected, that will give you 10, because five for the ventral uh, and the dorsal and the ventral portions. And then if you come to the thigh, you see here it is B and C, and then the back is E and F. So when you come to B and E in the diagram, you see that it is a tie representing the front and the back. In the three-year-old, the tie size is smaller, and that is 3%. In the one-year-old, it is 3%. And in five years and above, it's 4%. And then 10% in the 10-year-old. So if it is the front and the back, then it is times two. And then if you come to the leg, you see that you have C and F. So here you have 2% under, under one year old, 3% one year, 3% five years, 3%. So this, in essence, is a guide to help us to be able to calculate the extent of bends. So the minor bends are taken care of at, on OPD basis. 
and you clean the wound with mild soap or what we call savlon. Savlon bath is given to wash off any commensals that are on the skin and also some exudates that will be secreted on the skin by the veins. And then you remove blisters or do not remove blisters depending on the hospital protocols. You, it is recommended that the blisters are not removed if they are healthy. However, if the blisters are weak and will easily break, then it is removed and cleaned and dressed with silver nitrate and Vaseline. In cases where it is suspected, depending on the cause, some antibiotic uh, like penicillin or Vaseline permeated with some antibiotics may be placed on to prevent further infection. And then the wound is covered with the Vaseline and then augmented with some gauze to prevent adhesion on the granulation tissues. And tetanus injection is given. Now, currently, we have heard that since last year, uh, Ghana is stopped taking stuff of tetanus toxoid. But rather, tetanus diphtheria is what is available. In that case, anti-tetanus serum, ATS, may be given because you don't want to give diphtheria when you are treating tetanus. However, it all depends on the prescriber. So tetanus injection, whether ATS or TT, are given in cases where the child is more than five years to boost the antibodies stimulation for tetanus. And then major bends where the airway is involved, there is a need to maintain the airway and also replace fluid during the first 24 hours. This is the objective of our care. And we also will give some blood expanders like sodium, normal saline, sodium chloride, hypotonic solution, bring us lactate, and establish, re-establish a sodium balance in cases where there is some uh, imbalance and restore circulatory volume and provide adequate perfusion, correct any acidosis. And so you may give oxygen when there is carbon dioxide accumulation and also feed and improve renal function by giving the fluids. Drug calculation. We're saying that it's important that the fluid is replaced. So the first 10 kilogram of a child's body weight is multiplied by 100 mil. So we said the first 10 kilograms of the child's weight or newborn's weight is multiplied by 100. So if it's three kilograms, you have three times 100. So you have 300 mils given in 24 hours. We said the second 10 is multiplied by 50. So if you have, let's say, 12, 12 is equal to 10 plus 2. So the first 10 will be multiplied by 100, and then the second 10 will be multiplied by 50. So if you have 10 times 100 plus 2 times 50. So this will give us 1,000 plus 2, 5, 10, add a 0. So this will give us 1,100. All in meals. And this will be given in 24 hours. However, if the child's weight takes us to the remaining 
outside the first two terms, then the formula is the first term, let's say 22 kg. And this is 10, the first 10, plus the second 10, plus the remaining, which is 2. So the first 10 will multiply by 100. The second 10 will multiply by 50. Let me do it like this. And then the remaining will multiply by 25. So a child weighing 22 kg, the fluid calculation will be 10 times 100 plus 10 times 50 plus 2 times 25. So this will give us a thousand plus this will give us 500, 515 are two zeros and then 2 times 25 will give us 50. So this will bring us to thousand five hundred and fifty mils and this will be administered in 24 hours so take time give yourself some example of some weights and then you can calculate and know how much is required so we have said that the first 10 kilogram is multiplied by 100 the second 10 is multiplied by 50 the remaining by 25 However, with children, we give maintenance dose. And this is given by 70 mils is multiplied by the child's weight. So for maintenance, this is an addition to the calculation. The child with the bangs, the nutrition is very, very important because we know that the breakdown will have to be replaced with high protein. Because the proteins that will build the worn out or the destroyed tissues to enhance metabolic requirements in severe burns, nutrition is very key. So hypoglycemia can result from the stress of burns and injury and this must be addressed by feeding the child even if it's small bits at regular intervals that will help the, the child to run out or overcome the problem of uh, hypoglycemia because the liver glycogen stores were, are depleted by the stress of the veins. And then also the proteins, we have varying forms. You can have plant source, you have animal source. However, we know that the body is able to utilize the meat, the fish, the milk, we have to give more of these eggs, whatever we have available, whether the meat is guinea fowl or guinea pig or whatever form of protein it is, we're saying that at this time, the animal protein source is of great importance and the food should be given at regular intervals and should be served attractively. And we have to also encourage more hydration give coconut juice which is also very rich in potassium we give fruits like banana and or any other food that is in season now we have watermelons also very rich in vitamins all these will add up and help recovery so the feed if the child cannot tolerate oral feeds because of the stress of the banks nasogastric tubes or gastrostomy tube may be passed to enhance feeding. And also to ensure that all electrolytes are addressed, there may be the need to also augment this with some fluids and also ensure that vitamin or foods that are also rich in vitamin A, C and zinc are also given to promote healing. So oral feeds are encouraged where the child is not intubated and the child may have be giving food that is likes because he may have some loss of appetite. So the child should be encouraged. 
and with children, they are comfortable in the presence of their parents. So we have to allow them to be around and also to encourage the child to feed. And here, though the child may be old, we encourage responsible feeding where the adult or the nurse in charge of the care, depending on the condition of the child, may need to be fed to encourage the child to eat more. Also pain, we said, may also affect every other thing, including even organ function. So the appetite is also not excluded. So we have to make sure that the child is devoid of pain at the time of feeding. And all procedures that will induce pain should be done early in the morning and not be at the time of lunch and dinner because that will affect the child's appetite. Medications are also very important in this area and antibiotics are given to prevent wound infections, especially when they are cultured and the appropriate organisms are identified, then the right antibiotics are given to control for any wood infection. We know that green pass is by pseudomonas uh, bacteria. So when we are addressing the wound, we need to also take note of the discharge and the odor because they may also inform us about the nature of the organism causing the infection. The child is also sedated during wound care or most of the time so that the pain is controlled. In, in very severe pains, morphine or other opioids other than common analgesics like paracetamol may be indicated so that we stay on top of the pain because the pain can even affect the breathing pattern, the heart rate, and may even precipitate uh, infection because then the immunity will also be compromised and the slightest infection can become or go out of hands. IV analgesia is needed and may be given by perfuser when it is available in our setup. If not, may be given at regular intervals as prescribed. The management of the wounds, which is the primary focus, because here we are going to clean the wounds as determined by the degree of damage and infection. In some cases, primary excision may be done to reduce the incidence of infection. So the wound may need to be debride, sometimes in theater, to take off some necrotic tissues and reduce infection. And then hydrotherapy is done where we bathe the patients with savlo to wash down all microorganisms that may be present because we know that we have some bacterial and other microorganisms on the skin. So as we give them the baths, whether it's every other day or every two days, depending on the protocol, this should be done thoroughly to wash off and ensure cleanliness of the wound and it's part of the wound care. And the nurse is responsible for this. And so you must see it as a very key role and perform it adequately and make sure that this is done and considered as a sterile procedure and not compromised. And topical medications that are prescribed are given. Again, pain medication should be given so that we stay on top of the pain. And so it's appropriate that this is given 30 minutes before the dressing so that our affected child can tolerate the dressing procedure. Otherwise, it is one of the procedures that children or even adults with brains dread because it's very, very painful. However, if pain medication is given, we stay on top and then the patient can tolerate the procedure. It's also very important that the normal saline that we use to do the base bathing is tepid and also not too cold to cause vasoconstriction or spasms in the nerve endings and vasoconstriction of blood vessels. Also very important that we use elastic bandage to apply over the wound to provide the necessary support. And then also the Vaseline 
and then the silver nitrate dressings and any other that is prescribed is also applied adequately and to carry out infection prevention measures as, as much as possible. Make sure your hands are clean, you use sterile gloves and all other equipment or dressings that are used in this procedure should all be sterile. So when it comes to the methods used in managed burned wounds, to open topical antimicrobial agents are, are used especially and applied on the wound and left open in cases where it's minor and the, the extent is superficial bends and the extent is very minimal. In such cases, we apply the tropical applications and leave them open. And this can also be covered depending on the extent and the nurses or the physician's discretion. Considerations, nursing considerations. Acute phase, we need to maintain the body temperature as much as possible. So we use uh, warm solutions. We cover them with blankets because they are predisposed to a lot of fluid loss and as well as heat loss so that they don't get cold. And then also we need to monitor the vital signs every four hours in, in very acute phases. It's even every hour or every 15 minutes till they are stable. And also the input and output, the fluids should be calculated and it should also be even the, the soup, the intravenous fluids and any other thing that is giving should be calculated and the outputs, urine and vomitors or whatever should all be calculated to make sure that there are no deficits. And check the pulse every hour and the intravenous infusion should begin immediately the patient is brought in the acute phase. And the urine output in the child, we have said that one mil to two mil per kilogram per hour in children weighing less than 30 kilograms. And that is what our estimation is. And so that is what we look out for. And then 30 to 50 mil per hour in children weighing more than 30 kilograms. Constant observation and assessment for complications should be done. And then also, we should also look at the fluids in terms of electrolyte imbalances. So alteration of electrolyte balance produce clinical symptoms like confusion, weakness, cardiac irregularities, and seizures. And in this class, we have looked at hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, all these electrolytes in terms of potassium, calcium, magnesium, all affects or uh, produce some symptoms which you need to know by the end of this uh, course. And changes in respiratory functions and gas exchange result in restlessness, irritability, and increased breathing. So when you see some of these symptoms, you need to check the blood electrolyte to know which exactly is the cause of the problem. And there is high risk of hypothermia because of loss of protective function of the skin. Edema formation and circulatory impairment result in the loss of sensation in deep thrombing pain. So as I said, it's very, very important that we elicit all these and treatment will also depend on the hospital protocol and ensure that visitors comply with established protocols and also prevent infection and also give them the necessary psychosocial support, especially inform them about the benefits of the NHIS and encourage them to bring their cats along so that they can bear the hospital care costs. Once a condition of the child is established and wound infection is prevented, it will also help us assess for other complications and uh, infections, and then also will uh, shorten hospital stay in the case. So some, some signs and symptoms of infection you see, or you and I will see when caring for 
a child with bends, a disorientation. And this may result from septicemia and then also inadequate hydration, spiking fever, diminished bowel sounds, progressive paralytic ileus over 48 to 70 hours will also connote some signs of infection, especially, and then wound deterioration, when the wound begins to deteriorate, and then white blood cell counts is depressed and the child falls into septic shock. So there is a need to do the full blood count and all other tests or lab tests that will measure these indicators. And there is also the need to assess change in level of consciousness daily by talking to the child and assessing whether they are well oriented to their environment as you talk with them. And then the hypothermia and hyperthermia you will elicit by checking your vital signs, especially the temperature. And we said you should provide warmth by covering them appropriately. And then loss of progressive wound healing will be prevented by dressing well. But this is what you see in cases of infection and then increased fluid requirements and then tachycardia, the heart rate will go up. So this is where we end and this is our references.